Welcome to this week's episode. Um, before we start, I'd just like to address something from last week's episode. Um, we were talking about the situation we find ourselves in, my mum's health, things like that. And I'll be honest, the comments section and the feedback we got from people was enormously supportive. And we, it was uplifting. Thank you very much. Um, what can I say but a hearty, hearty thank you to all of you who um, left such lovely comments. Thank you very much. But the uh, subject for this week's <laughs> is a bit of a continuation of last week. Last week we talked about some of our mistakes that we made when we bought the boat. Um, silly mistakes, because we just didn't know any better. And I thought we'd maybe continue that on. We'd have another go at some of the other mistakes that we made. <laughs> After having had the boat for quite a while. And let's start, shall we, with the great anchoring cock-up. 2018. <laughs> I don't seem to be able to get anything right. I'd really do try my little best, but uh, we were pulling up the anchor this morning and um, we'd got um, a ball on it so that we could see where the ben, ben, um, thing was, the anchor was. And uh, Bev said, one thing I don't want you to do is to drive over the bloody Ball. Basically what we uh, did was we used floating rope. We had a in our head that we needed an anchor ball to mark where the anchor was and we also had in our head that we needed floating rope because it floats so it won't go under the boat will it? Turns out it will go under the boat if you drive the boat over the top of it which is exactly of course what we did because we were driving toward the anchor ball to pick up the anchor. Now if you've watched any of our more recent episodes you know we use an anchor ball as a, a tr to hold our trip line and that by and large we haven't mastered these days. <laughs> but back in 2019 we didn't. <sighs> and it put us off anchoring for the best part of another year before we tried that one again. <laughs> I guess it's a case of you live and you learn don't you? But I'm glad to say that these days the anchor trip works a lot better. Uh, we no longer use floating line for the, um, the anchor trip. We have a weighted line which goes down lower than the keel of the boat um, so that the line under the anchor ball is always vertically down towards the seabed. Even if the anchor ball comes and bangs against the side of the boat, the line is vertically under us. It's not. It never goes under the boat. It never goes near the keel. It never goes near the rudder or the prop. It always hangs down two metres and our keel is 1.75. And that was our simple solution. But you live and you learn. And once again, no harm is done. Bit of dented pride. That was the worst that came out of it. <sighs> I've been cleaning the bilges out today and they were filthy. I mean, when we get to winter, the water gets cold, we get a lot of condensation water in the bilge and of course you get dust, you get muck, you get dirt, you get everything down there, it's like soup by the time you're done. And if you don't clean them out, it winds up clogging your filters, um, not filters, beg your pardon, it winds up clogging your bilge pump and if you ever need your bilge pump in an emergency, the last thing you want is a clogged bilge pump. Unfortunately, sometimes you can be dealing with what you learned and if you learn rubbish, or at least things which are not universally applicable, that might be a more polite way to put things, then you can get yourself into a lot of bother and a lot of trouble. And that definitely happened to us. We learned to sail in and around the Mersey, which has the third highest tides in the world. Spring tides in the Mersey are 10.2 metres. And, you know, with something like that, you get a bit blasé when tides are a bit less than 10 metres. It wasn't explicitly drilled into us, but you do sort of pick up the, the vibes that any tide under three, any tide height under three metres isn't worth bothering about. Any tidal stream that runs under three knots isn't even worth worrying about. Generally it was a racing club, so I think the attitude was more a lot of press on, there's no such thing as reverse. And if you can sail the Mersey, you can sail anywhere. That last one turned out to be total tripe, as we learned very, very quickly. So that if we get into difficulties or anything like that, which could easily happen. I think what our biggest lesson from that episode was, 
Well, there's no shame in turning back. In fact, sometimes it's a very, very good idea to turn back. We should have recognised that the sea was getting rougher and rougher the further south we went, and we should have turned around and went back to Peel. Now, we might not have got into Peel because of the, the uh, lock gate, but we could have taken a mirroring ball. We could have gone against the harbour wall. We could have gone into Port Erin, taken a mirroring there, maybe anchored there, but we didn't. We pressed on. And there was the issue of the pilotage. So this is uh, Reeds and um, what Reed says is in bad weather or at night keep south of Chicken Rock. So we were in bad weather that's why we went south of Chicken Rock. Additionally it says by day with winds of less than force three and a reliable engine of greater than five knots. Ours, by the way, does about five knots. It's not really greater than. Uh, go between calf sound and uh, calf of man. Um, realistically, though, they should really say what wind direction they're talking about because our wind, in our particular case, was from the south. So it doesn't matter um, about the wind speed because the actual island protects the calf whereas we didn't think about that because it says less than three we think thought that because it was greater than three we couldn't go it was just uh, inexperience really after that we got local knowledge from the local sailors after that particular day um one thing i will point out is that any youtuber or any sailor who takes video off the sea will always tell you that no matter how rough it gets out there, the sea always looks flat in the video. So that they say things like, oh, it was a really, really, really rough day. Where do you see the video? And then they all look at it and people go, looks a nice day for a sail, that. For some reason, the camera always flattens the water out. So bear that in mind, because in this video, you can see the waves. And if the camera flattens the water out and you have big waves in this video, Think what it was like for real. So this is where we had a new problem. One, well, at least a new problem to us. Might not be a new problem to experienced sailors, but it certainly got us by surprise. And that's what I can only call when the pilotage disagrees with each other. So we'd two different sets of pilotage. I think three actually. With three different sets of information. And they all disagree about when slack is, what direction the tide is, when it changes. And it's an area that you know, because you've been in before, that it's pretty critical to get the tide right, because if you don't, you're not going against it. If the tide decides to flip and you're in the wrong place, you're going back the way you came. There's a lot of choice in this, unless you own something really powerful, like maybe a lifeboat, or a really, really big vessel. So we took a consensus, and this happened. This is pushing against the tide then, isn't it? Yeah, because you can see it running. Oh, God. So, um, this is uh, pilotage for Rathlin Sound. And uh, one of the phrases it says uh, for the pilotage is that you mark the passage with a fair tide. Now, I know most of you know what that means, but for me, I didn't. Beverly did, but she didn't share that information with me. I thought it was obvious. <laughs> no, it was not, but never mind. So what fair tide means is obviously that the tide is going in your direction. Additionally, you actually want quite a bit of it because the problem is with the slack, which is what we were aiming for, it starts then going against you. Do you know what a nasty tide is? Yes, I do know what a nasty tide is. Would it be a short step from there to an ugly tide? Yes, I do. Well then, surely a fair tide would be the opposite of an ugly one. Well, anyway. Just like a fair princess. Fair enough. But regardless, it's going in your direction and it's going in your direction 
for longer than you actually need it because you need to be at your destination um, and in. Glad we got that sorted, Princess. Yeah, well, anyway, whereas going for slack, which is what we did, uh, meant that we then started having the tide against us at one point and that just was no good. You may be aware of a phenomenon which is known as the Great British Sense of Understatement. Where when things are going horribly, horribly wrong, the British are supposed to say things like, well, it's a tad rough today, isn't it? Or, oopsie, that didn't quite work out, did it? All I can say is that the pilot sometimes has a wonderful dose of understatement. So this is a reading of the pilotage for Q and Sound and um, this is the statement The stream reaches its greatest strength soon after turning Okay, so what was the other bit that concerned us when we read that? Um, well, we thought that the stream was going to be the greatest strength after turning and then another section a little bit further on uh, reads uh, going towards the Firth of Lawn which is what we were doing on the flood flood a strong eddy can make it difficult to steer the recommended course between the rock in mid channel and Cleet Rock as there is a tendency to swing suddenly towards Cleet Rock so what we were thinking was that we didn't want to go um, through the sound just after turning because it was the strongest uh, tide um, you know and we didn't really want to be being pushed towards Cleet Rock but it's just one of those things it can be quite difficult to sort of like get all the information together and interpret what you should be doing Basically, the passage was going to be rough after the turn of the tide. That's when the tidal streams were strongest. But that little thing to say that it eased after some time, we now understand, means that it goes from blooming hell to, oh my God, this is awful. It doesn't actually become, oh, that's nice. It's just a different degree of awfulness. And we learned that the hard way. <laughs> Particularly the bit that says the tide sweeps you onto the big rock at the bottom. That really gave us the collie wobbles. It got to the point we dropped the camera. Help! No, it's fine. Just to well. Okay, stay this way, stay this way, there's more water. Once you're clear of that point, stay this way. Right, our course is on the fleet rock at this point, believe it or not, I think, or is that a tank line? No, no, not this much, not this much. Aim for the tree. But part of it says in the book, No matter the state of tide, the brief passage is always full of interest. <laughs> so just be wary of that phrase. And this leads me on to what I've termed the inexactness of everything. No matter what the pilotage tells you, you've got to take it with a grain of salt. Um, there's no point in working your tides out to the nearest centimetre or working the time the tide turns to the nearest minute. If you get your tide heights to the nearest half metre and you get your tide turning to about the nearest half hour, that's probably going to be good enough for most applications and most time. If you're really depending on it being right to the last centimetre, you maybe need to have a think about whether you should be doing that passage. So, that was our lessons. They were a bit rough and I hope you can benefit from our mistakes. <laughs> Please don't make the same ones we did because well, yes, it may develop you as a sailor. <laughs> it certainly isn't any fun. <laughs>